So, if we could have the first panelists to come up and join me, please. We have Steph Van Gompel from the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. We have Professor Dr. Thomas Hopner from the Technical University of Wildau and is visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Dr. Eleonora Vazati from the University of Southampton, one of our help yourselves to wherever you want to sit. Um, and reacting to that, we have from the institutions, from the Estonian permanent representation, of course, the presidency is with Estonia at the moment. We have Mary Lioja, who is the Councillor for Judicial Affairs. So, since time is tight and we are going to be really pushing it, I'm going to, as soon as we've had our chance to have all our academics speak, I will ask for you know, reactions from our institutional representative, but then please feel free to raise your hands and catch my eye if you have a question for our panellists as well. So, without any further ado, I will start then with Steph, over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> So, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this debate. I think it's uh, very important that uh, academics get a voice in the parliament to discuss these important issues with policymakers, and I hope this will be an open debate also with stakeholders, etc. Well, on the publisher's right, um, let me first start. I'm very skeptical of this proposal. Although I agree that the problems that press publishers are facing are real, I think that the introduction of a new IP right to solve that issue is not a good idea. So let me explain this. First of all, the problem. I think that no one can deny that with transition from print to digital, newspapers, news publishers have witnessed a serious decline in revenues. First of all, um, uh, we have seen that uh, structure, we have seen structural changes in consumer behavior. Nowadays, news is increasingly consumed online. Uh, different formats are used, a variety of news sources are used, and that led to a consistent decline in sales of print. On top of that, we've also seen structural changes in advertising markets. Online advertising has grown at the cost of advertising in print media, also resulting in a loss of revenues for news publishers. And this puts them at pressure, especially the gatekeeping power that they are supposed to fulfill. If, money, if less money is available for quality journalism, Citizens' access may be jeopardized, and this may lead, or this may harm the public debate. So this is the background against which the publishers called for this new ancillary right. And they claim that they needed to take legal action against online infringement and to license their press publications online. And here comes my first objection. I think that the introduction of the press publishers' right is unnecessary because press publishers already enjoy rights in their press publications. In general, they get their rights to copyright in those press publications assigned by journalists, photographers, etc. And I think this should provide them already with sufficient protection uh, to protect their interests and to license their content online. And if publishers face difficulties to prove that they own those rights, that is not a market failure, that's a, a problem of rights administration. So if you want to improve that, I think that's a better alternative than introducing a new layer of rights, which essentially grants the same protection that they already have. A second objection is that the, the, a new IP right will not solve any of the intrinsic problems that the press is facing. For one thing, the creation of a new IP right will not uh, change the advertising market nor consumer behavior. And these are the, these are the drivers of the problem. And furthermore, there is also no evidence that the introduction of a press publisher's right will aid media pluralism, although that's assumed in the proposal. Even if it would yield additional income for news publishers, it cannot be automatically presumed that, more, that the money that will be generated will be invested in better content and in better news coverage. And in fact, the proposal may even have adverse effects on media pluralism, as it is uncertain how online media will respond, the online news aggregators, Googles, etc. And the examples that we've already seen in Germany and Spain show that after the introduction of a press publisher's right there, Google News and other news aggregators stopped providing access to newspapers' contents. And this not only negatively affected the accessibility of news online, so the accessibility of news in general, but it also led to a decline to a fall in referral traffic to newspapers' websites, and thus to lesser advertising revenues for the newspapers, and especially for smaller newspapers. A third objection is that the press publisher's right may have negative effects on authors and journalists. 
First of all, for freeline journalists, which are increasing, which journalists are working increasingly as freelancers. To establish a name and reputation, which is crucial for their business, they need maximum exposure of their content online. And the press publisher's right might hinder that. And also, the publisher's right might actually worsen the bargaining position of authors and journalists. There is no guarantee that more money will become available in this market after the introduction of such rights. So if the pie would grow, which is unlikely, the surplus will presumably be taken by press publishers. But if the pie remains the same, there's a reasonable chance that publishers will demand a larger share of it, which will lead to a smaller share for journalists and photographers. And my last objection is that the pro proposal goes way further than what is required to cure the problems. If the intention is to protect the serious press, why then is the definition of press publication so broad that it covers virtually all publications that are published per periodically under the heading of news, including newsletters, blogs, glossy social media, and the like? Why do publishers actually need such broad exclusive rights if the ID is only to allow them a share of the profits that online service providers make from the use of press publications? Why does the right affect all online users of, of news if the real intention is only to target the use of press articles by social media, news aggregators, and search engines? And why a 20 years term of protection if the commercial lifespan of most press articles is no longer than a day, a week, or a month at most? These are all questions that the proposal leaves unanswered. So let me conclude. I think that the proposal for a press publisher's right is flawed. There is no evidence that it will meaningfully contribute to addressing the problems that print media are currently facing. Further, there is no genuine need to add a new right in press publications, as news publishers are already protected by copyright. And lastly, it's still unclear what the potential impact of the proposal is on the position of journalists, on media pluralism, on future business models, and on the licensing market for news. And therefore, I urge policymakers to be cautious. I think that the proposed publisher's right could better be replaced by a presumption that publishers represent the author's copyright in press publications, as was introduced, as was proposed in the draft report of the jury committee earlier this year, or that it be removed altogether. Thank you for the time. Thank you, and thank you very much for sticking to the time. Uh, let's turn now uh, to Mr. Hopner. Your turn, please, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak and present my views. I would actually like to turn more to a direct response to my previous speaker. Um, I think it was well outlined why the press publishers are in need of a better protection. The commission's impact assessment revealed that 57% of users access news now through search engines and aggregators and that some 47% of those do not click through to any original site. What does that mean? It means the traffic stays on the aggregator size and does not end up on the source website of the press publishers. So they cannot monetize the traffic, they cannot monetize users that are interested in their content. Rather, the advertising budgets go to the aggregators. So in response to that, in order to sustain their business model of providing content for free to every consumer, they have asked for a better protection against such exploitation. And the proposed pe press publisher's right is addressing that. Most of the criticism, in particular the one we've heard today, actually results from a certain misconception of the scope of this press publisher's right. The first objection that we've heard is that we do not need such right because it is ultimately the same as the copyright of the authors, the journalists, and the photographers, and that the press publishers can have these rights anyway by way of an assignment. Leaving aside the difficulties to get such assignments, if you're talking to thousands of journalists that are reluctant to share all the rights with the press publisher, that is beside the point because the legal threshold for an infringement of that copyright is a different one to the one proposed by the press publisher. That is because to infringe a copyright by way of a reproduction of that content, 
you have to demonstrate that a part of, an, of a text has been taken that as such is original. So it contains some personal individual creation, which is understandable because ultimately copyright wants to protect the creativity of the individual author. However, this threshold is not adequate, not proportionate when it comes to the right that is at stake here. Here, the threshold is a different one. The threshold for an infringement by virtue of a reproduction of a press publication is whether a part of the fixation of the collection of journalistic works is reproduced. And that can be the case even if that part that has been taken is not as such original. Why? Because the protection does not aim and to protect any originality, but investments. And the investments in press publications are made irrespective of whether the particular extracts that are taken or not are original or not. Because of this different threshold for an infringement, it is not correct to say that the new right would not expand the press publisher's rights. Rather, it does the opposite. It broadens their bargaining powers. Based on that false premises that we were talking about different rights, it's also clear to me that the mere presumption of ownership of the rights of the authors is insufficient, simply because even if the press publishers had all the copyrights of the authors, the journalists and photographers, that would be insufficient due to this, due to this inadequate threshold for an infringement of copyright. Also, the other criticism, I think, are beyond, beside the point. Of course, media pluralism is protected and enhanced if privately financed media companies are protected in their competition against other private companies that try to exploit their investments by simply taking their content to compete against them. The more self-financed media players you have, the more the better the uh, media landscape is. We don't want to rely on publicly financed uh, broadcasters. Also in this respect, the reference to the reactions in Spain of Google News is not accurate. It is correct that referral traffic dropped, but that was to be expected. What is more important is that direct traffic, the direct call-ups of press publisher sites, basically users turning directly to press publisher size increased. And that is what press publishers want. They want to attract users directly to their website to engage with them, to get them into subscription models, or at least to have them as their individual customers. Then it was claimed that the right somehow threaten, threatens authors and journalists. I do not see how that could happen, simply because journalists are part of the press industry. And this right is aimed and capable of empowering the entire press, including all its elements, including journalists. I, for myself, do not know any journalist that would rather be visible but unpaid to one that is actually paid. And to ensure that he can be paid, this right pays a contribution. Finally, um, it was claimed that the right goes further than it is actually required. That is not correct, because what has been claimed here, that it would cover all sorts of publications, including any blogs and um, journals, um, is not correct. The most important built-in restriction of the press publisher's right is the actual definition of what a press publication uh, is uh, made of. And that definition is rather narrow, because amongst others, it requires a continuous editorial responsibility. Editorial responsibility is something that differentiates established press from fake news, because editorial responsibility means you have a judicial responsibility and a legal responsibility to ensure that the facts you are providing are correct. And that is not the case with other publications that have been mentioned earlier on, and that therefore do not merit the same protection and would not fall under the legislation. Finally, let me also address the concern that it would somehow reduce consumers' access to information. I do not see how that can happen, because ultimately this is about ensuring that press publishers can continue to make all their press publications available online for free. 
that they do not have to hide it behind paywalls, that they do not have to pr produce less uh, valuable content, that they do not have to go offline just to protect their content. So ultimately, it's about making sure that consumers can continue to enjoy all this quality journalism. The alternatives would be paywalls, and I don't think that this is something we should uh, promote. Moreover, the proposal clarifies that mere linking uh, to such publications is excluded and that the general exemptions apply, including the right to quote, so consumers uh, do not have to be nervous that they themselves uh, could be um, infringing the right. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving over now then to my left is uh, Dr. Eleanor Rosati from the University of Southampton. Good afternoon, everyone. I've uh, prepared uh, um, a map, a visual map, of, uh, of course, in a simplified uh, version of uh, what I think are the main issues um, on the table in relation to the press publishing sector. And in particular, uh, by using this map, what I would like to discuss with you, uh, of course, I don't have uh, precise answers. I would like just to invite a reflection on these issues, is uh, to explore uh, the main options that are currently on the table and have emerged over the past few months to remedy what uh, has been recognized as a problem in the press publishing sector. And in particular, the two current options uh, for discussion seem to be, on the one hand, the introduction of uh, a new neighboring right in favor of uh, press publishers, and on the other hand, a, a rebuttable presumption of representation in favor of uh, press publishers. Publishers. So, which is best uh, uh, between these two? Um, I would say that it is necessary to start from what the problem is as identified by uh, the European Commission. And essentially, the problem relates to the fact that uh, revenues have been declining in the press publishing sector. And in this respect, it is important to highlight that, uh, of course, uh, things might have accelerated with the advent of the Internet, but in certain countries, revenues have been falling consistently, at least since the uh, advent of the television. So it is not necessarily a, a new phenomenon. Having said so, uh, the two main issues that the press publishers appear to be facing is, on the one hand, uh, their uh, weaker uh, bargaining uh, position vis-à-vis uh, -vis uses uh, by third parties of uh, their uh, publications, and on the other hand, uh, issues connected to enforcement of rights. So these uh, issues have justified and prompted intervention at the level of individual member states, and with specific regard to the press publishing sector, this uh, has been the underlying rationale of initiatives in Germany and in Spain. The impact assessment uh, of the European Commission accompanying the proposal for a directive has highlighted that these national solutions have been only in part successful. And one of the reasons why the success has been impaired is, is due to the lack of scale of these solutions. And here, uh, of course, it emerges a potential internal market problem. Um, and uh, prompts a reflection as to whether intervention is needed at the level of uh, the European Union. And of course, if this is the case, that there is the need for a, a new intervention in this area, uh, action of EU legislature must be informed by two key principles that are those of subsidiarity, that is that action at the level of individual member states alone is not sufficient, and proportionality, that the action undertaken at the EU level does not go beyond what is necessary to achieve a certain objective. Having said so, the Commission has identified uh, the introduction of a new neighboring right as the solution that is the most appropriate to solve uh, the issues identified in the impact assessment. And uh, one question that arises from a substantial standpoint is whether this new right would actually assist press publishers in recouping part of the revenues lost uh, also to the web and improve their position when it comes to licensing rights and enforcing them as well. 
uh, as uh, Steph has uh, highlighted, in uh, many cases, uh, press publishers own the copyright to their pub press publications. Um, so one might wonder uh, whether, from a licensing standpoint, a new right is actually necessary or will improve things significantly. From the point of view of enforcement, uh, I think uh, that uh, um, a discussion might be open as to whether there might be less intrusive measures in alternative to the introduction of a new right. And this brings to the second option on the table, that is the introduction of a rebuttable presumption of representation. This is something that has been in place in some member states already for some time, and has been indicated in the draft report by MEP Comodini Caccia as the preferable uh, solution. It is also one of the two options on the table uh, for discussion in the context of uh, the uh, Estonian presidency, from what uh, I understand. So, the introducing a rebuttable presumption, similarly to the press publisher's right, I don't think will solve the issue of missing or declining revenues, and probably will not be that different from the point of view of licensing rights. But from the point of view of enforcement, if I don't think that the presumption will be worse than having a new right, but it will have a significant advantage that it appears a solution that achieving the same effects will be more compliant with the principle of proportionality in the sense that it would be something less intrusive than introducing a new right altogether and will also avoid injecting further complexity in a system like the one of you copyright that is already fairly complex per se. And in this sense, I would also like to uh, add by responding to a point uh, made by Professor Opner that uh, indeed uh, it has been held that there is a right to quote and that uh, the usual exception will continue to apply even if a right was introduced, but it is important to recall that at least from a formal standpoint, uh, the vast majority of exceptions under EU copyright are optional for member states to adopt. So uh, the problem lies in the system that the EU legislature decided to adopt uh, several years ago, uh, among other things, with the Information Society Directive. Okay, thank you very much. And that's our three academics. I'm sure most of you in the room have heard the bones of those arguments many, many times before. Um, but I will turn now, because it is up to the Estonian presidency, who've put forward various proposals on Article 13, to uh, turn over now to Marili Ocha to uh, give your response or comments or questions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> uh, as this panel has uh, showed, indeed, there is very diverging views uh, uh, here as well as uh, in the Council. Uh, we have not formed a position yet, uh, so I'm not here to defend one or the other side, of course. Um, uh, we have discussed only uh, twice in the technical level uh, uh, the publisher's right. Uh, once uh, when we went through the text article by article, uh, and the second time um, when we had uh, thematic or uh, so-called issues uh, uh, papers uh, discussion. And now, uh, since the, the proposal has been out almost a year already, it was time to finally uh, get a little bit more concrete in the Council as well to propose some uh, text textual changes uh, to Article 11. Um, as mentioned, the, the, the views in the Council were uh, very different. Uh, it was uh, not really clear where uh, the majority of the Member States or the Council as whole would like to uh, go. Uh, therefore, we thought that uh, uh, it would be better to propose two options, which uh, most of you most probably have already seen from the leaked uh, documents as well, and which was already uh, mentioned. Uh, by previous speakers as well. Um, I agree that uh, we have to start uh, tackling the, the issue at hand from uh, identifying the problem or problems. Uh, and uh, that's why the discussion in the Council has been also focusing uh, on the fact if the 
which is the correct uh, or the most suitable uh, and proportionate uh, measure. So there is also there two camps, uh, whereas one side uh, is uh, very supportive of the publisher's right, uh, introducing it uh, to the legal, uh, uh, to the EU legislation, and on the other side, then uh, the second camp uh, thinks it's uh, it's not. Uh, uh, the, the best measure, uh, and they're a little bit uh, uh, skeptical about it. Uh, I think that's about it, what I can say at the moment, because as mentioned as well, we are actually discussing our first very preliminary compromise or the two options at hand next week. So we haven't even presented it uh, to the member states. So uh, unfortunately, I can't go more into the detail. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now First of all, um, let me see whether we have reactions down here from either the Commissioner or from Julia Reda. Because, nope, and no questions so far. Okay, I will open it to the floor then to see if we have any questions here. Yes, already, Till. If you would please use the microphone, introduce yourself, and if it's to a specific member of the panel, which member of the panel it's directed towards. I've got a question to Mr. Höppner. My name is Till Kreuzer. I'm from Germany. Um, I'm, I'm leading the Eagle Initiative, which is the initiative against an ancillary copyright for press publishers. So you, it's obvious what I'm thinking about these aspects. But I've got one question, because it's always not very clear which is the intention behind it. But I want to ask you, if I got you right, Mr. Höppner, you advocate for an exclusive right on the smallest parts of publication, publications of any kind, which means um, on the language more or less ex itself. It's an exclusive monopoly. It's, it's an exclusive right on, let's say, a headline like Angela Merkel meets Donald Trump. And you say, and you want to tell us, that this wouldn't be a problem for the freedom of communication and everything else as an academic, not a publishing lo um, lobbyist. Did I get that right, or did I get it wrong? You got right that it's a different scope than the copyright, but what is not correct is that it would mean that smallest extracts of every publication would now be monopolized. First of all, there is no monopolization because the actual facts that are in all these information, all these news extracts can of course be used by anyone. Secondly, there is only an infringement if there is a reproduction, at least in part, of the fixation. And the fixation has to contain all the elements that are now in the definition of a press publication, including, for instance, that it comes with a title, the title of the press publisher. So the extract that you take from another publication has to refer or has to contain a clear reference to the press publication. Why is that? Because the, the argument is, well, these aggregators are also benefiting of the reputation of press publishers by referring to them with their title, their established brand that users are trusting in. So if you just take a text and do not refer to the source, so you are not taking advantage of that brand, there is no rep infringement because there is no reproduction of what is defined as a press publication. So, uh, to, to get this clear, right, short extracts of press publications can be an infringement if they contain a reference, a clear reference to the press publisher and thereby take advantage of its reputation. And may I, may I ask what kind of reference is that? So, in practical well, terms, the, what, the name, what is that, the, the, the reference? The, the name of the press publisher, its company title. Well, I don't get it. Well, maybe well, we can... If there is a link to New York Times, then you are referring to New York Times, and you are saying this is a reliable information, what I've presented to you here. That's why, trust me, you don't have to read any further. But if there is no such reference to any press publisher, people will not take it for granted and do not give it the same value as they would give a press publication. But if I write in my blog that I'm referring... I'm writing the New York Times reported today that about this or that topic, and I have a little sentence out of that. Um, this is a, this is, I'm a lawbreaker. I think then you would use a quote, wouldn't you? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> 
Steph, I want you to answer that, this question about snippets. Well, I, I actually want to, to continue on, on this, because if, if, if it's only a right to a fixation, what then exactly is this right for? If it's merely the fixation of a newspaper as published, is it then a photograph or a scan of that newspaper that you want to protect, or do you also want to protect the content of it? Because if you want to go protect the content of it, even a small snippet of a factual news item, let's say the, 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 the newspaper, in the, in, in many newspapers have on the front page, have an image of the, new, of, the, of the weather. The weather today in Luxembourg is 18 degrees and it's quite cloudy. It's about eight, nine words. Can I then take that over? Is that, is that the content that is protected by this news publisher's right? It's a very quick question, but if that's the case, then, uh, then you start protecting facts through a new neighboring right, and I think that's completely against the Berne Convention and many other international treaties. Yeah. Okay. No, the right is not... Uh, sorry. sorry, I think sure. we're gonna move on to another question here. Yes, hello, thanks for the microphone. I'm Dimi from Wikimedia, um, we do uh, one of our most well-known projects is Wikipedia. And what we like to do at the end of a um, Wikipedia article sometimes is create um, what people call an annotated bibliography, which means um, we basically give the title of um, articles, including news articles, we link to that, and we very shortly, um, maybe in a sentence, explain what it's about, maybe you know, give a short extract. Now that's an annotated bibliography, it's quite well recognized in, in any kind of academic um, work, and it's what we use on Wikipedia. Now, my question to the, to the panel, and anybody can answer, I don't have a preference here, is under this new ancillary copyright press publisher right, would or would not um, annotated bibliographies fall under that? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to this side and see whether the ladies want to tackle that. Well, uh, it would appear uh, that uh, from uh, the description of the proposed right uh, that uh, Professor Opner has provided, uh, I would say that the answer is yes. Uh, that there might be a discussion uh, around whether uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, use falls under an applicable exception. But again, it is not that there is a new exception that would apply to the EU press publisher's right, because uh, the exception that will be applicable in this case will be the national ones uh, that member states, as a matter of fact, have implemented in different ways, and the national judges have interpreted in different ways. Well, first, the collection of links that you mentioned are links, so they are excluded. So if there is any room for an infringement, it would be what you write on top of that. And there we have to distinguish. If you provide your own summary, obviously there is no infringement. But if you just take extract from that, then the question is, can you still rely on the quotation right or not? And that depends on whether you automatically take these extracts, no matter if they have anything to do with what you're actually writing, or whether there is a certain reference of what you are writing to the original source, because that's only the, the purpose of a quote. Again, another issue is whether it, it's actually realistic that anything would happen in this scenario, because it's crystal clear that this is not the typical case where the press publishers you know, are after. We are talking about a public information source here that is not generating any advertising and therefore not harming press publishers. So I cannot see why that would cause them to be after you. Well, the, the question is, of course, whether a quotation exception will help you, because the, the quotation exception usually depends on the context that you provide. So if you merely provide a link and uh, uh, an, an excerpt of this article, then I'm not so sure that you can actually state that you would fall under a quotation exception. I, w I wish you would, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, I have a question to the representative uh, of the presidency, Julia Reda, uh, member of the European Parliament. I, uh, uh, Professor Höppner just said that links were excluded from the scope of the neighboring right. And in the texts uh, that you have uh, presented, in both uh, or uh, in the recital where it says that hyperlinks uh, are, or acts of hyperlinking are not covered 
um, you have clarified this is only the case when they're not a communication to the public. And indeed, the uh, original Commission proposal also says that. It says acts of hyperlinking are excluded when those acts of hyperlinking are not a communication to the public. Now, many of us know the case law around communication to the public that sometimes when you set a hyperlink, you are communicating to the public the thing that is behind the link. But what if the title of the newspaper article is not behind the link, it's part of the link? So basically, wouldn't you always be communicating to the public the, the article's title if it is part of the hyperlink itself? So are links really excluded if they are a communication to the public, which, well, they are if the article title is part of the URL? Uh, the hyperlinking uh, issue has been discussed also in the Council Working Party and uh, I guess we still need a lot of thorough discussions uh, on it uh, also, uh, also in, in those aspects which have been mentioned uh, by, uh, by you. Uh, I understood uh, when we were discussing it uh, initially in the Working Party and from the Commission's explanations that, uh, that they didn't want to change uh, the, the current framework, so it, it is uh, uh, as it is. Uh, now it's a policy choice if we actually need to change something within that text to, to make uh, those issues uh, more clear and clarify the text, but this is still under discussion. Okay, let's see whether anybody else wants to weigh in on this question of hyperlinks. Well, if you take the URL out of the hyperlink, what is left then? There is no link. So, uh, you know, I can't see this ever being interpreted the way you suggested, because of course a hyperlink that consists of the URL, which is the title of the article, is and will always remain hyperlink, so it is excluded from the right. You know, how, how else would you want to create a hyperlink? The, the Court of Justice purpose of excluding hyperlinks as a communication to the public was, of course, to keep the internet, if you like, alive. And because it's so vital to have the linking technology, it wanted to protect the linking technology. The linking technology consists of hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are URLs. URLs will always be um, seen as hyperlinks. I, I cannot see that any different. Well, I also think that uh, the hyperlinking uh, might not be uh, um, um, covered, but uh, I do, uh, I do wonder, wonder what happens indeed if the title is contained in the hyperlink. Of course, that can be evaded. I mean, it's not necessary. Most of the times you, you see nowadays that they have the, the number headings rather than, but it, it's possible. I, I don't think that we can definitely exclude that it's part of the, of the scope of the right. Thank you, uh, everybody, for your interesting presentations. I guess I would like to ask um, Professor Hopner if that's okay. Um, my understanding of uh, the argument as it is is that there are two camps. There is a camp for a right and a camp for a presumption. And I'm just wondering, or my understanding of your argument is that the right is better because... Uh, it's difficult to pre prove legal ownership, but also, I guess... From your talk, the ASIC journalists might not want to assign the copyright from their articles. So is that the principal issue, that people don't want to assign the copyright in their articles, and so that's why publishers should get a right? So I mean, there, there are several, uh, two key aspects why a presumption is insufficient. Secondly, a presumption is and will always be a presumption. So you can only presume what actually exists. And if there is no assignment, then a presumption will not help you because they can prove the opposite, that there was no assignment. So the right doesn't help you at all. Secondly, as I've indicated earlier on, if you have the copyright of the authors, that doesn't help you against mass exploitation of your works by taking extracts because for every single extract, you would have to prove, which is almost impossible, that these extracts contain an element that represents a personal, individual, creative work, so some original element, which has nothing to do with it because you actually want to protect investments rather than creativity, so the test would make no sense. So for these two reasons, you know, presumption doesn't grant you the right, and secondly, the right would not be helpful when it comes to mass infringements by taking 
extract a presumption would not really get you anywhere. Eleanor, let me throw that over to you. Do you agree? But, you know, I, I have a question uh, that, you know, if you wish, is a bit provocative. Uh, I retrieved, um, you know, browsing the Internet, uh, a document uh, that in 2015 uh, a publisher's uh, um, representative organization released in which, uh, you know, it was discussed uh, the uh, challenges facing the press publishing sector. And uh, um, the document uh, revealed that uh, both the option of a new right and a presumption of uh, representation would have been sufficient to address, would, would have been you know, a good step to remedy uh, some of the issues that the press publishing sector faces. So uh, I wonder what has changed since then that makes now the option of a uh, rebuttable presumption not really acceptable. What has changed in the industry that might prompt this kind of uh, uh, different approach in a way? I must admit I do not uh, know the article you're referring to, but I could imagine time uh, moved on a bit and publishers have learned their lessons, for instance, from the developments in Spain and Germany, so they know what works and what will not. Okay, more questions? Yes. Microphone, and please introduce yeah, yourself. Working. I hope this one is working, you can hear me. Hi, I'm Ines Tuhanek, and I'm from IP Watch. And um, Professor Höpner, if you don't mind, I also have a question regarding to the um, practice, the practical world in Germany. So in Europe, we don't have a, um, a neighboring right yet for publishers, we'll be talking about it. Um, but in Germany, we do have it, as we established it earlier uh, as, uh, already. Um, what do you think from a practical view, because the media and uh, also leading um, academic circles are talking about that um, it has actually failed in practice? What would you say about that particular concern? Right. Uh, thank you for that question, because it's a relevant one. You would think, well, what does the experience in Germany uh, teach us? Well, first of all, we have to keep in mind that the current legislation was the outcome of a very harsh compromise. And I would argue the compromises went so far that what was left is not satisfactory to any side. So it's simply not working for several structural weaknesses. But in my view, these weaknesses should now not be taken as an argument to say, well, it's not working, but rather we should consider how to improve this not working legislation to make it work. But what certainly is a success of the legislation, irrespective of a possible lack of, of a flow of remuneration, is that it got aggregators, it stopped aggregators in their track. It may very well be that the landscape today in Germany would look much different when it comes to the scope, the amount, and the size of news aggregators than it does. So while there may not have been such a flow of revenues as some publishers may have expected due to a, an issue that is actually related to copyright law, which has to do with competition law, um, it nevertheless fulfilled the purpose of stopping a business model that is simply based on exploitation of press publishers' rights. Okay, well, you didn't touch there particularly on the Spanish case. I mean, I wonder, do you want to address that, or does any of the other panel members want to talk about this particular foul-ups in, in Spain? Is that? In Spain, there, has been, there have been studies, uh, at least uh, to, to indicate what kind of effect it had on, uh, on, uh, on traffic to newspaper uh, uh, websites. Uh, I think that the, the NERA uh, Institute produced two studies, one in 2015 and recently in the beginning of this year. And you, you see I have some numbers here of the 2017 study, which show that after the introduction of the uh, uh, right in Spain, which is an obligation to pay compensation for online news sharing of articles, uh, the traffic to the newspaper websites fell by 5.3% on average. But that is also a, a big uh, a difference between the larger publishers and the smaller publishers, because it was only 4.9% for large news publishers, but 12.6% but for smaller ones. So that, that at least shows that uh, um, um, 
the, the referral traffic uh, to, to the smaller sized uh, uh, news publishers is more uh, in danger than, than the bigger ones. So the, 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 the linking through to the bigger news websites, that might still be interesting for the news aggregators. Um, um, so they might actually uh, uh, base their, uh, uh, their efforts in, in licensing, if it would come to that, to the, new, to, the, to the big news publishers, not to the smaller ones. There is a, there is a danger there, I think. All right. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, Oliver Hinter from the University of Cologne. I would argue against Mr. Hoppner that uh, Germany has actually learned from bad experiences. When you see the new copyright law in Germany, we've de uh, excluded some of the mistakes we made before, so the copyright law is a lot easier to understand and that it works. And I think the European Commission th should think about it as well, because uh, the publishers are learning from it. They're offering much more content, not for free anymore, so get, they're getting remunerated already by the content they're offering, so consumers will pay for it. And if they look for it to, to uh, get more money from a lot of users that will use it, it's the better way to do it than uh, trying to do the case law that you have now. I mean, the discussion shows it's so hard to actually to identify what will be protected and what will not be protected. So you should not really rely on that discussion, but not think about it anymore and think about new ways of earning money and not uh, trying to solve this way, which is not going to be solved anyway, I guess. Okay, who else wants a comment here? Yep. Um, <clears throat> hello, I'm Armin Teige from the Berlin State Library. We are one of the biggest research libraries in Germany. And I've got an issue with reference to uh, the Wikipedia topic. Um, again, to Mr. Höppner, I, I, was just, um, I would just remind you of how blurry this citation exception is. And we are many times uh, when we talk about research pu publications which live of citations and quotations and bibliographies, <laughs> we would many times be in a really legal gray zone. Can you guarantee that citation, citations and bibliograph bibliographies in research publications will be lawful in the future and research will not take place in a re legal gray zone then? Well, you're getting all the tough questions, I'm afraid, because you're, you're sort of out on a limb here on this panel. But um, I think we're probably going to come back to talking about a little bit more on the, on the third panel, that issue. Um, we're going to stick a little bit more to, to neighboring whites here. Have we any more questions specifically on topic in the room? Because if not, I'll move on to some of the rather unusual questions I'm getting sent via Twitter. Um, so people who are watching via live stream, please do keep sending in your questions using the hashtag fix copyright. And one of the questions I have is whether proposals, which I believe are in some of the amendments, to link any uh, uh, payments back to remuneration for journalists, um, would that change your perception of the, uh, the ancillary copyright? Well, you may be aware that in the German legislation, we actually have that provision that ensures that journalists are adequately participating in the, any remunerations that the press publishers gain. I wouldn't see any r reason why that shouldn't be or couldn't be adopted on EU level. And the fact is, as I indicated earlier, journalists are part of the industry and uh, they would one way or the other benefit of their publishing houses, their employers uh, doing better than they currently do. If they have to leave off employees, no one is benefiting. Well, presumably this position, provision is, is you know, suggested because there isn't enough evidence to ensure the journalists make money from just a rising tide. Well, then, yeah. be <laughs> okay. So, Sorry, what is your position on any proposal to link remuneration back to journalist remuneration? Well, unfortunately, uh, the council hasn't formed the position, so so I can't comment uh, on it. And uh, and as as uh, usual, is the presidency doesn't have a position. We are the on honest broker. So, sorry. Well, in the end, it it, it 
it all depends, of course, in, on whether this, where such a proposal will generate additional revenue. I mean, if it does not uh, give additional revenue and publishers start getting a share of it, uh, I think that, that journalists in, in the end will lose out. Okay. Um, another question sent in then is, could a user-generated content exception help to mitigate the negative effects of Article 13 on users sharing content, for example, homemade video, that sort of thing? Oh, sorry. Yes, so it is. Um, so, the other question then is, is coming in, it's quite provocative, is why do panelists believe or do they think that the commission is proposing the opposite of what the REDA report recommended? That's a hot potato that I'm sure we all want to hear your responses to. <laughs> I think it's not a secret that Ms. Reda has a completely different approach to copyright protection, which is basically there shouldn't be any protection at all. And against this background, it is little surprising that the current more realistic uh, proposals are far from that. Well, I think that we can't exclude that some heavy lobbying has been going on here and that the Commission got influenced by that. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, well, you really don't want to talk about it. Okay, uh, perhaps, Julia, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> Um, I think everybody who has read the RIDA report can be reassured that it does not recommend uh, the end of copyright. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question over here. Yes. Uh, my name is Alea Lopez de San Roman from the League of European Research Universities, and it's a question for Professor Hobner. So we are wondering about academic publishing, and since you are in favor of including this new publisher's right, you as an academic would also be in favor of having an academic publisher under that new right. As far as I'm not mistaken, in one of the retails, it excludes such academic uh, publications. So. We had the ITRA committee the, at the parliament who was broadening it to academic publishing, so it's not clear yet where it would be including Man, it or Maybe not. it should be clarified a bit <laughs> better. So, more questions. Who wants to be next to put something to our panel? Jill. Okay, I'm going to take one, Miss, because that was like, basically you just said, everybody else should pay but not me. Like linking to um, publications, scientific ones that I'm going to use should be free, but linking to news articles should not. So basically, you place, uh, sorry, maybe I got this wrong, but you were like saying the whole time, well, if you're linking to, um, if you're using press articles, you should be liable. And then you just said, well, if the text is saying, if you're using scientific articles, you should not be liable, and the text should clarify this. So. I understand that research is important, that's perfectly my opinion, but I do think political debate, the capacity of society to get to an opinion in a common way and exchange opinions should not be infringed by copyright. And you just put those two things completely on two different platters. No, I was talking about the particular case of academic publications and whether they should fall under the definition of a press publication. And my personal view is that they do not have to, because if you weigh up the interest, there is an additional interest here, which is academic research, openness, innovation, and all these things. And academic papers you know, that I've written are written to boost not just the egos of the writer, but also, you know, pay some contribution to the journal. And the business model is different. It's not the same business model as a newspaper that is basically dependent on having journalists all over the world looking for what is happening, keeping them paid, informed, equipped, and all the rest of it to gather all the information that then produce news, not just because they fancy writing articles, but because these news are something everyone is interested in. And then the press publisher has to pay those. And 
this business model, of, which is also ad finance rather than subscription-based as academic publications, is so differently that I can see good reasons why we shouldn't put the same in one basket. Both in one basket. Okay, I'm going to take off my very neutral hat here and be a freelance journalist and sort of challenge you a bit on the idea that somehow academic publishing has more value than ethical, responsible reporting to society. I mean, why would you say that? No, I'm not saying that it has more value. It's just it comes with a different business model and a different, you know, position. Also, you know, I, I cannot see the rivalry here. I mean, the press publishers are concerned about aggregators, you know, using and exploiting their content for advertising purposes. Now, academic publications are not financed by advertisement. So it's a different business model. and. The, the, the threat there is not the same. So that, that makes, makes it different as such. But you know, I'm, I'm not in any field there. I, I, would also be, I think it would also be acceptable to say one and the same. But if you want to find reasons why academic publications should be excluded from press publications, I think there are a few. OK, well, let me turn this around then to the rest of the panel. Where do you think exceptions should be made, and, and how do you justify them? What do you mean exactly where exceptions should be made? Can, can you clarify that? Taking, for example, I mean, do you agree that academic publications should be um, exempted? Well, I am already not in favor of a press publisher's right, so I'm certainly not in favor of extending it to any other types of publication. So uh, I think that I'll leave it to it there. OK. And Ellen? But, uh, I think that uh, one uh, should indeed uh, base uh, the assessment on whether there is an actual issue, whether there is an internal market need, and if so, what action would comply with subsidiarity and proportionality? And to use these basic core principles, which I've not seen explored as in depth as one should have when having the discussion around the press publishers. And I think that this is an important conversation and an important assessment that has been somewhat overlooked. This idea of proportionality and whether there's been a thorough enough assessment. Well, I think that whether there's a thorough enough assessment, I think that the, that the, the impact assessment um, uh, is right in pinpointing the, the, the two drivers of the problem. The, 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 the consumer behavior that changed, uh, the advertisement market that has changed, but as I already said in my contribution, I don't think that an IP right will solve any of these drivers. So I don't see the link between the problems that are in the impact assessment and the solution that is offered. So I see don't, don't see proportionality there. Yes, and I, I, I don't like to repeat myself, but I think your skepticism is based on the fact that you assume that the scope of both rights is identical, which is, is not the case. And this somewhat takes away the foundation um, of your, your criticism. I think it is proportionate because of the exceptions that have been excluded, the limits that are enshrined in the definition of a press publication, and the scope of the right, it's actually narrower than the related right for broadcasters or mu music and film producers. So if you talk about proportionality, press publishers could all have if, you know, argued and campaigned for, for much more than that. So I think it actually strikes a rather decent balance. More questions for or comments to our, okay, so. We've had tales, so I'll come back to you if we've no others. But Leonard, then. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, I also have a question uh, for Mr. Höpfner on proportionality, since this was mentioned. Um, um, I'm working with Allied for Startups, and we're representing a startup organization and startups across the globe. Um, the one question we have on proportionality is, so when working with startups on, on, on this copyright directive, one thing became very clear. Um, startups are definitely not looking for a, a free ride on copyright. They're very much ready and stand ready to be compliant and pay their share 
in a proportional manner. So what we've seen happening in Germany, for example, is, and I'm just wondering whether that might then uh, end up in being the European plan. What we've seen in Germany is that a company like Google has been granted a free license, zero euros, mm -hmm. but we also know about startup companies that have been sued by individual press publishers mm -hmm. over uh, sums like uh, 30,000 euros plus one euro per snippet that they would use, or 50,000 euros as a lump sum just uh, to find an agreement to use their snippets. So my question is whether the press publishers, or whether you think perhaps that the pre uh, press publishers are now trying to do uh, the exact same thing on the European scale, where they're just continuing granting uh, uh, free licenses to those that they can't find, but actually go after those that they can fight, which uh, would be startups in that case. OK, I think there are several issues in this. One is the actual question of startups, and the, actual, the other is relating to, let's name it, Google. So with Google, you're right, in Germany, they have the press pressures and the collecting society has not succeeded in getting after Google. Why is that? Because Google could say, if you insist on your rights, you will be directly or indirectly penalized in the general search results. Because we will only show you very small, which under German law is, is also acceptable. But the result of that is you will get less traffic through our search engine. And that was a threat that German press publishers simply couldn't take. But this threat only is due to the monopoly that Google enjoys in search, which gives it the power to basically force and pressurize others to waive their rights. But it's something that copyright as such cannot deal with because copyright law cannot deal with this monopoly issue. That would have to be backed up with some additional provision that makes sure that, for instance, if you have a threshold above some percentage, um, the right may not be waived or something. But copyright law is not well equipped for that because it has the approach that everyone should be the same. So of course, every press publisher is, is um, not happy about this outcome that you know, the, the, arguably one of the largest infringers um, was capable of getting off the hook. But that is only due to the weakness of the legislation and net in Germany and not due to the fact that such a right uh, is not working. Luckily, there are not just, and there is not just a Google here uh, that we are talking about, and it, it's not, it is not a lex Google, as some have claimed, but there is a big business out there for aggregation services, and at least there where copyright law can do its purpose, um, it should be used. And what, if that means that they are now going after startups, no, they are not just startups and Google, there's also a lot in, in between. And in addition to that, if startups did their uh, job, their legal uh, compliance prior to launching their business properly, they probably would not have uh, had any infringements. I am only aware of those platforms that were aggregators before, and they probably knew quite well that now that's the end of their business. Uh, could you also answer on the proportionality aspect? So how do you make sure that even on a European scale, this law will ensure that uh, every company who is contributing to that is co contributing in a proportionate manner and not in a manner that reflects their uh, legal departments or their legal strength? OK, well, if you want to go that way, proportionality can only be ensured by making sure that dominant companies cannot, by virtue of their dominance, make others waive their rights. To do that, you would have to make the right unwaivable, meaning that you, as a press publisher, may not grant Google the right uh, to, to use your content without any remuneration. But if you make it non-waivable, then, of course, you have others saying, well, that makes it even worse, because then press publishers can, cannot even select those aggregators that actually benefit them. So then you have others that counter against that. But my very personal view is a balance could be found by suggesting or implementing a clause that says, if the infringer has a market share of above 30% on any given market, the right is unwaverable. That would ensure that not by virtue of your dominance you can force others to give up what they have legally deserved. Okay, yes, next. 
Max Anderson, Member of European Parliament for the Swedish Green Party. I have a question. Uh, this is technicality, but let's say I'd write an article in the Swedish press strongly opposing ancillary copyright. Would I be allowed to publish that article, including the headline, which the Swedish press always rewrites? Would I need a, a, a license in order to link to this article on my own website? Well, if the, if the, if the, the article is made available uh, for free online by the newspaper, publisher, you don't need to get a license to link to that article. If you're copying content of that article on your own website, you might need a license. Yeah, I've been in that position. Yeah, you should just ask your editor. <laughs> Hope for the best. But yeah, you, if it's behind a paywall, it's behind a paywall. And journalists, although there's a lot of discussion here about you know, remuneration and how we like to sell our copyright to multiple publications in practice, it just doesn't work like that. The first publication that you sell to is probably also the last if you're talking about news publishing. Um, just, just to get this right, but that would not be any different from the current situation, because currently you couldn't do that either. Because certainly your whole article would infringe copyright, in this case of your own, but because you have assigned your right to the press publisher, you are actually not in the position anymore to you know, waive that right. So it would be the press publisher that could, of course, say to you, even though you are the author, you have assigned your rights to us, so do not publish and multiply your own publication elsewhere online. So that doesn't change with the press publisher. So why then do we need it? Because that is not the case we have in mind when we talk about press publishing. OK, I think uh, we're probably going to wrap it up there because I see the coffee has arrived and we have other panellists waiting in the wings. But thank you very much to all our panellists and uh, hopefully they will stay down and continue the rest of the conversation.